Can, can, I don't know. If I had each of you hold oh my, my wrist, like this, you could see I'm not turning the wrist. You don't do that. Okay? But what you do is just, it's kind of like a quarter rotation. Okay? It's not a twisting of the wrist. It's just like that. And how much you do that, you know, you might find out that you do this a little too much and it breaks like this much. And you want to cut down on that break, just cut down on this. If you find it don't, it's not moving at all, then add a little to it. Some guys throw what they call the slurve, which is a combination. Guy can't throw a good slide, he can't throw a good curveball, he throws one in between. He's given a lot of this. But he's not going like this. He's just giving more of that. Yes. You won't hurt yourself on any pitch if you throw it properly. And that's the whole key. You know, now, if you guys, you know, don't know how to throw any of these pitches, don't throw them until you're taught. But you can always throw the fastball and change up without hurting yourself. And the whole key to pitching, guys, is, you know, if I were to say to you, what do you throw the ball with? You guys would probably say, your arm. The coaches would think I was asking them a trick question, and they would say, your body. But what you actually do, guys, is you do throw the ball with your arm, but you must use your body to get your arm in a position to throw the ball. And if you don't use your body to get your arm in a position to throw the ball, your mechanics are off. Your mechanics are off. And let me tell you something. If I watched you take out here today, and I said, hey, Sonny, you know, your mechanics, uh, they need improvement. And you said, hey, listen, wise guy, I pitched a no-hitter last night, and I won 10-0 on my team this year, and I'm the best in the league. And my only response to you would be, you want to be better. And no matter how you're pitching or how we're hitting, you can be better. And you can last longer by throwing mechanically right. So don't ever tell the coach that you've been doing too good to change. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do we have time to talk about <laughs> about uh, warming up before a game? Okay. you might end up being in that situation. <clears throat> of course, there's two types of pitches. There's the starter and there's the reliever. Now, the starting pitcher, I like to see him follow this type of a pattern. <clears throat> he knows when the game is going to start. He must know how long he needs to get loose, to get warmed up. He must know those things. Some pitchers, take 15 minutes, some take 20 minutes. On a very, very warm day, usually everybody takes a little bit less than normal. What you're trying to do is get the, get the blood flowing. Now, what I like to see pitchers do, first of all, is before they're set to start warming up, do a lot of, do some stretching. You know, stretch in through here, stretch in through here, stretch in through this area here, stretch your trunk area, there's several exercises you can do. Then maybe jog a lap around the field. All right. All right. Now, when you start warming up, guys, you, you always pitch off of the rubber. When you're in the bullpen, if you have one, okay? You pitch off of the mound. Let the catcher start off, if you were playing on this size field, let the catcher start off at about 45 feet. Throw him about 10 pitches, maybe. As you're throwing those 10 pitches, you might even throw the curveball because it loosens up certain muscles back here that the fastball doesn't. But you're throwing easy. You're throwing easy. Nothing 
that burns me more is kids go down the bullpen and start pumping hard right away. That's no need for that. Joe's uh, stupidity on his part. Then after about 10 pitches, let the catcher move back to about 55 feet. Another 10 pitches, then let him move back behind the plate. Now, you must throw from the stretch when you are warming up. Even though we all know we're so great, nobody gets on base. I've seen it happen where sometimes somebody gets on base. So we have to be ready to throw from the stretch sometimes. Okay, so we pitch from the stretch about a third of the time to a quarter of the time that we're warming up in the bullpen, which means maybe five minutes. We're gonna throw from the stretch. We must throw all of our pitches. I don't know how many pitches you have, but you should throw them all in the bullpen before the game. I think it's a good idea for you to have somebody stand up there as a hitter while you are doing some of your pitching after you get loose, while you're doing some pitching in the bullpen. Have the guy stand up there as a right-handed hitter. Have the guy go over to the other side as a left-handed hitter and throw with a guy up there. And if you're that guy up there, if you're that batter helping out your pitcher, guys, wear a helmet. If you're that catcher warming up the pitcher, wear a mask. Preferably even shin guards, but definitely a mask. Okay, and I would say about the last three minutes of your warm-ups, about the last three minutes, which might mean about 10 pitches, maybe a little bit more, you really let loose. You're throwing those like you would throw in a game. And then give yourself a little time to go in and sit down, Catch a breather before you got to go out on the mound. Okay? Home team pitcher has to start warming up a little bit earlier than the other guy because he's got to take the mound first. Okay? That's your starting pitcher. <clears throat> Relievers, guys, you want to do your stretching out and your running before the ball game because you never know when you're going to have to. You can't. Coach says, okay, uh, Jones, get down there and warm up. And you say, hey, coach, switch out for us and take a left on the field. You don't have time for that stuff, guys. You know, you've got to get right down there and get loose. And a lot of times, you know, when the coach says to get down in the bullpen and get loose, you better run down the bullpen. Because you can't walk down there and you say, oh, geez, coach, uh, where's the new balls? Uh, uh, who's going to catch me? Somebody on that bench ought to want to catch that pitcher because the team needs him. So you've got to go according to that routine. <clears throat> so the relief pitchers have to do their running before the game, stretching out before the game, and stay ready. And from that time on, they might get the call at any time during the game. And the relief pitcher, uh, they're a different breed, guys, because some of them can get ready on about seven or eight pitches. And some of them need more time. And we as coaches have to know that. And uh, you know, one of the things you're sitting on the bench as a coach and you want to know, gee, I'd like to get this pitcher out of the game. Is my relief pitcher ready? And one of the common signals that everybody seems to use, so, you know, instead of yelling down, hey, John, are you ready to go in there? You know, instead of yelling down like that, people just take off their hat and hold the hat and wave the hat. That means the pitcher's ready to go in the game. He's ready. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Preferably on the mechanics, if you have any questions. I know everybody likes to talk about different pitches, but would anybody have any questions? Yes? Is it all right to throw sidearm? Is it all right to throw sidearm? It's not the worst thing in the world. No, it's, uh, <clears throat> I would look at you and I would see, and I would do this for anybody, no matter where you were, what, what uh, position you were throwing in. Is that where you seem to be most effective? You know, oh, are you just a lazy guy who likes to throw down there? You know, and I would try and look, and I might say to you, listen, let's try to get you up a little bit higher because I think that you'll be able to do this, this, and this. And you can't do it down there. For instance, sidearm pitches, you know, usually are sinker ball pitches. Well, if you're throwing sidearm and your ball is not going down like that, then maybe I'd want to try you another way or, or find out why it's not because 
that's where the best position would be for you. You've got to throw that sinker ball throwing sidearm, and you have trouble throwing the curve throwing sidearm. You know, you can't get it to break downward like you like to see because of your position of your arm. One thing you want to remember, do you throw sidearm? One thing, don't let your arm come in tight. In other words, still keep it away from the body. Don't let the elbow come in. Okay? Yes. Okay, what you want to try to do is just take something as simple as this. You don't even need a ball or even your glove. And just make believe you're on a pitching rubber anywhere. And just try and pivot like this here. Get yourself in the habit of that type of action where you're turning your hips. All right? An awful lot of pitchers don't turn their hips. Um, and they have to learn to do that. Some guys turn them more than others. Some guys come in here and turn about like this. Some guys turn about like this. Okay? But benefit to start doing it. It's good for you to start doing it. To be turning your hips. Yes. Well, only from the standpoint of remembering your mechanics. In other words, you still have to keep that arm away from you. Okay? You can't let the elbow get in tight. Alright? And that's that can be a problem with a sidearm pitcher. Some of them want to throw like this here. But if you're out here and you're throwing with your arm out here like this, then uh, that's not a big problem. Let me tell you one other thing, guys. I see some guys, you know, the first thing, I might see a high school kid pitch and I say, he's breaking his hands too late. Now, before I would automatically go and change that kid, some kids, some people compensate in another area. I have seen some pitchers who break their hands a little late and do get down here in the proper motion, but they'll be speeding their arm up a little here, and they compensate for breaking their hands late. So rather than teach them a whole new thing about where to break their hands, they've adjusted already within themselves. So I wouldn't automatically change them. You gotta see, does the kid make his own adjustment? And that's important. Any other questions? Yes. Good point. Good point. People do that. And when you drag your arm, you're dropping your elbow. And what you've got to do is you've got to get yourself up top. I'll tell you one thing that, uh, and maybe we'll close with this guy, but I think this will help you. Just to catch a tennis ball with a glove, what happens? Pops out all the time. That means that you've got to get this down. You gotta be able to get the ball. Remember I told you when I first started, you gotta be able to feel for the ball. I know it's right here on the top of my glove. All right, right in here, because I can feel with these two fingers. All right, this is the way, more or less, I like to have the hand in the glove. Okay, spread out, but like this. Some guys go like this all the time. I can't understand it. I don't go around catching a ball like this, do I? I catch flies like that, okay? You know those black ones, okay? But I'm talking about you, you, you've got to be able to catch the ball and hear somewhere you've got to be able to feel for it. So now I go down cellar with a tennis ball and I take the tennis ball and I just throw it against the wall. And you practice just catching the ball. And then you can throw it over here a little bit and you go like this and you practice doing that. And sooner or later, as you continue to do this, the ball is going to go into the glove and it's going to stay in there instead of popping out. And you can do it a little bit this way, you can do it a little bit that way, you can do it right at you, all right? But you have to practice it. And I don't know if you guys, you know, really, it's the biggest key is that you have to practice and practice and practice. Okay? That's one of the keys. Now, any questions? I went through a lot. The slow hit ground ball. What foot do you go down with? Does anybody know? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Left foot. Excellent. You had a great coach down here this week. You know that? Huh? In other words, I just got done saying, get over here first. I just got done saying, here's a slow hit ground ball, and he just told me the left foot. Some of you guys, when you go after the slow hit ground ball, you 
like to get it like this. Just like I told you, a ground ball is a medium hit. You can't do it. You got to get it off the front of your left foot, right in here. All right? You got to get it in here somewhere so it looks like this. And I go through the ball. I get it here. You got to be thinking about left foot. Here you think about the ball. And there you think of the throw to first base. All right? So what I'm saying is that you've got to, as you're going after this slow hit ground ball, and I don't care whether you're playing for a second, third, or shortstop, the slow hit ground ball, I've got to be thinking left foot, I got to get the ball here somewhere, one step to the right, and you're throwing the ball over the first base. All right? Now that takes practice. Now you can do that yourself just by putting some baseballs, that's what Brooks Robinson used to do, in front of him and run after, and how did Brooks used to get him? Bare hand. I say if it's rolling, use your $110 glove. All right? If it's stopped, pick it up bare handed. Now, some guys, as it's rolling, they pick it up with their bare hand. I've seen too many guys get it on their thumb or someplace and then they screw it up and they don't make a good throw because the ball is sitting in your hand. If I get it in my glove, I know I'm going to get my two fingers on it and be able to whip it to first base and get the gun. It'll all come together. Why do you want to do that? Don't be lazy. Actually work on keeping the belt buckle in front of the ball. While he's getting his stuff on, we talk a little bit about throwing. The catcher throws a little bit differently from most other positions. The catcher has to get rid of the ball quickly. Outfielders and pitchers, down, back, up, throw. If a catcher takes all that time to go down, back, up, and throw, too much time is going by before he releases the ball. So a catcher is going to have what they call a snap throw. Some people wrongly say it's a throw from the ear. But it's really not quite like that, because throw from the ear means you're going to go like that and push it out. It's not really quite like that. The best way to explain a catcher's throw to you would be, this ball here, as I receive the ball and come out to throw, I want to keep that ball shoulder high or higher the whole time. I don't want to bring it down here. I want to keep it shoulder high or higher. But something that might help you would be to imagine that the elbow leads the ball back. See how the elbow leads the ball back? The elbow leads the ball forward. And now I come right over top with the fingers. So it's back and forward. And there's always movement. You get back to the point where it's a a little bit stretching, you start to feel it, now start to go forward. Now the elbow leads you forward, and you're right on top of the ball. You've heard a lot about the grip. What do you imagine is the best way to grip the ball? Across the wide seams or with the seams? Across the wide seams. Why? Yeah. Keeps it straight. Keeps the ball straight. Any of you guys second baseman and shortstop? There's a steal. You go over to cover the bag, it's all you can do to get to the bag on time, and here comes a big old banana. Really tough to handle. <coughs> Good overhand throw will not only keep it straight, but it'll make it carry better too. Now, I don't know if all of you understand this, by the time you leave here, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, you ought to understand what across the wide seams means. This is the wide part right here, across the wide seams. You want to hold that ball out on your fingers, but if I were to release that ball, I get that kind of spin, and I get actually four seams. One, two, three, four. So you got four seams working for you. Aerodynamics says it's going to carry better, and it's going to be straighter. So when you're playing catch, not only will you work on your footwork and getting in front of the ball, but when you play catch, you also will try to search for the seams. Every day you play catch. Search for the seams. Sometimes you'll come out okay and sometimes you won't. There's no way, there's no catcher in the world who will say he was able to get uh, the grip across the wide seams every time. But if he keeps practicing by playing catch, then he will learn eventually to come out with the proper grip maybe two thirds of the time every break you can get so it's something to work on but when you're playing catch you can do that and I'm not just talking to catchers here I'm talking to infielders and outfielders 
that want to work across the wide seams. So once again, the throw is up where the bowl is shoulder high just about the whole time. A couple of other points to keep in mind with the throw is it's a good habit to point that shoulder where you're going to throw the ball. This kind of turns at the upper body so that you can then release from there. Something else I'm going to talk about that helps you when you throw is if that back foot, that right foot, if it stays a little bit bent, it's amazing what that will do for carry on your ball. If your back foot is a little bit bent, you get a little more push off. You get right back to hitting, get the hips going in. If you throw with that back leg a little bit bent, you get your whole body helping in your throwing arm. If you're a pitcher, you're out on the mound, you're a pitcher, and you try to pitch, push off that rubber with that back leg straight. Back leg straight, you really can't ever throw the ball too hard. Because the back leg being straight just takes away from the kind of push off that you want. When you pitch, you want to have a little bit of a sit down and push off, a driving type action. Same thing holds for a catcher. Stay low so that as you get your footwork set to throw, that back knee is bent so that I'm using my body as I throw. Another thing, elbow has to stay high. I mentioned that ball's gonna stay about shoulder high the whole time. So you wanna keep the elbow high. If my elbow's high, I release the ball. I'm gonna get a good overhand spin right there. If I bring my elbow down, now my fingers are kind of off to the side. See? They're off to the side with the elbow down. Now I'm going to get that big old banana. So elbow must stay high the whole time so you can actually feel those two fingers coming right on top of the ball. Good snap. So that is throwing technique for the catcher. Now some of you are combination pitchers and catchers. Tough combination to live with too long. You may have to commit yourself pretty soon because a pitcher wants that full down and back arm action and a catcher wants to get rid of that ball quickly with the shorter arm throw. Come on up here with your stuff. You got your mask. Just stand right up here. Okay, just stand up. One thing I noticed the other day, a couple of people were buckling on the inside of the leg. Always buckle on the outside. It doesn't matter so much anymore, but it makes it look like you know a little something about baseball. It used to be the buckles were real bulky and would get in the way. And if you had buckles on the inside, you go to run, you'd end up falling down on your nose. So buckles should go on the outside for the shin guards. Turn around a second. If it's too loose here, uh, you should be able to make adjustments on the straps. However, you might want to cross a couple of these to make it a firmer fit, okay? Notice that the chest protector has a fat side and a thin side. You really show your ignorance if you're a right-handed kid, you accidentally get this thing on in, inside out, you get the fat side over on the throwing arm side. See, it makes sense that you want that thin side there so that you get good freedom uh, for throwing, and this side over here affords more protection. So make sure you have the fat side on your glove side for the chest protector. Get that thing as snug as you can. Get it as snug as you can so it's just part of your body and you don't have it flopping around. It just slows you down if it's not fitting properly. Okay, the mask needs a throat protector recommend throat protectors. I got a few balls in the throat in the past and it does not feel good. Throat protector is a good modern device to help protect one of the few areas that are not really protected for a catcher. So be sure you have throat protectors. In fact, they're required in most states. They're required of catchers. Skull cap is required of catchers, I believe in most states in high school ball good to have a skull cap because a lot of times the batter will swing and the bat will come around, crack them on the back of the head, and uh, the skull cap helps to prevent injury there. Oh, 
Okay. You got everything but the cup, right? You're stupid if you're a catcher and you don't wear a cup. Anybody have a cup laying around here? You're wearing them all. Oh, okay. Some of you don't know what they look like, I think. Gives you a lot of courage if you have this on. You can handle ground balls. You go after ground balls a little more aggressively. And you insert them with the point pointing down, right? Uh, Polish catchers, I think, go in that way. <laughs> Chinese go in that way. Be sure you have that. Not just catchers. Infielders ought to have cups. Outfielders ought to have cups. Everybody ought to. It just makes for a little bit more courage when you're going after a ground ball or whatever you're going after. Okay, thanks a lot. The Met. The mitts today are a lot like first baseman's mitts. And I often mention in these little talks here at the camp that the old time mitts were what were called no break mitts. And you really needed two hands to catch the ball. No break means, you see this right here? A little flap, a little hinge. That makes it like a first baseman's mitt. The old mitts didn't have that. The old mitts were just kind of all the way around. They had one little pocket right in there. You had to catch that ball just perfect or else it would drop, pop, pop right back out of your mitt. You had to catch it perfectly. So that meant you needed to use your meat hand a lot more. And that's why a lot of old time catchers have all crooked fingers. Some of the more modern catchers now can cheat a little bit and don't have to bring that meat hand in quite so quickly. And so their fingers are in a little bit better shape. So this is what's called a single break mitt. And this is probably the best recommended mitt there is. This is a good one here. This Wilson 2400 is a good one. Now they do make mitts that have double break. You see there's a little hinge here. They do make mitts that have a hinge here at the base of the thumb. Anybody have one of those? 